I'm a Lock fan, and I direct the networking and mentoring core at the Johns Hopkins AITC. Um, so in order to preserve bandwidth, uh, right after the introductions, I'm going to be shutting off my video, but uh, you should be able to see my deck. So the purpose of the webinar today uh, is to sort of just walk you through preparing a pitch uh, for your venture. Um, it's a pretty standard uh, 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 format. Uh, so, and I'm happy to take questions as we go along. Uh, I don't intend to go past the allotted one hour and hopefully we can have discussions along the way. Uh, the purpose of this again is to prepare uh, you to, uh, to help you to prepare a pitch for your, for your idea. Some of you may have really done this. Uh, so, you know, this could be repetitive for you. Others who have not done this before, hopefully you'll be instructive. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the point is to help you uh, get ready. Uh, what's going to happen is right after this webinar, uh, uh, the A2 uh, Collective Head Office is going to be sending out an email with instructions on um, when you should submit uh, your pitch uh, deck uh, for possible selection uh, to do a live pitch during the symposium. Uh, that we are planning. And for those of you who are not selected to do the live pitch, uh, because you know there are many of you and we only have a space for about six to seven pitches, uh, what we would like to do is to have you prepare posters of your idea. So you could actually use elements of a pitch deck to put it on a poster and we'll have display uh, spaces available for you to, uh, to show your work. Uh, the purpose being that you can use this as discussion points to network with others who are going to be attending uh, the symposium. So entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, uh, you know, we'll get clinicians and their engineers, uh, might get a regulator or two, or at least people who understand the regulatory environment. Uh, so the whole point being that you have all your ideas in a very succinct fashion so they can talk about it. Uh, and hopefully what you're going to do uh, in terms of preparing the pitch uh, is not going to be wasted, right? So you're going to spend your time doing this and then ultimately you're going to recycle this thing. And as you continue to develop your idea, you will refine your pitch and then eventually it's going to become your calling card uh, for your venture. So that's sort of the whole point uh, of, 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 of this session today. And again, as I said, if you have questions, put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and uh, and ask it. So let's let's uh, let's get going. Excuse <clears throat> me. So the learning objectives of this webinar is to uh, basically achieve three things: uh, understand the key elements of the pitch deck, how to make your case uh, to a skeptical audience, because um, I can guarantee you uh, that uh, you will at some point in time face a skeptical audience, especially if you're going to ask them for money. Uh, and you have to be able to present a compelling case for why they should give up their money because you have the best things in sliced bread. Uh, and you know, just very quickly uh, go through some best practices for formatting and pitching your deck. Uh, and this is, you know, a both from my experience having how many pitches, how many startups over the years, over about 35 years of doing this. Uh, but also, you know, myself pitching my own ideas, pitching my own companies. And then, of course, from the research on pitching, best practices for pitching, et cetera. So the information comes from a whole bunch of different places. So very quickly, uh, just the definition of what a pitch is, right? Uh, so it's a, it's a concise articulation of uh, the problem you're trying to address, the solution to the problem, why it's valuable, like why is your solution the one people should pay attention to, and uh, how you will actually create this value in the competitive marketplace. And typically speaking, not always, but typically, the audience for your pitch would be potential investors. Why is that? Because they are the ones that are actually taking risk in investing in you, right? So it could be your first employees, right? So you pretty much do the same kind of thing. I mean, I recently, you know, my company recently just hired a CEO. Oh, about a month ago, and as obviously we're a startup and anybody who wants to join a startup is taking a risk. Uh, and 
you know, in the same way we are pitching investors uh, in in a um, in a, uh, a, a pre 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 money round. Typically, the pitch should not last more than five to eight minutes. Typically, uh, for a first pitch, obviously the goal of a pitch is to get the next meeting, right? So what you want to do is you want to interest your audience sufficiently that they call you and say, hey, can we have another meeting? Let's go through it in greater detail, maybe sign a non-disclosure agreement, and then really get into the guts of what you are doing. Uh, so that's sort of the purpose of the initial pitch, right? Once you get past that and you get the second meeting and the third meeting, then it gets a little bit easier because you have a bit more time to actually go in deep, talk about the technology, talk about you know, the problem you're trying to solve, talk about the market, so on and so forth. So that's the purpose of a pitch. So what are some of key elements uh, of uh, in a pitch deck? Almost all pitch decks have a very similar set of key elements. On the left-hand side from one to five are what I consider the sort of must-haves, right? Every pitch deck must have these five things. An articulation of your unmet need, the size of the opportunity or the opportunity itself, you know, how are you gonna make money from this thing? the solution you're offering, what you want from your audience, the ask. And then of course, a description of the team, because obviously you are doing something new and your solution is on one hand, a vision. There might actually be a technology behind it, but it is unproven, untested. I mean, even a proof of concept is largely untested, correct? It's not been market tested at least. What you have is you have a team, you have competencies, you have experts, uh, and more often than not, the investor would be looking at who is in the team because they are the ones, you know, an understanding of the team is a form of understanding the risk behind the venture. Uh, given the right-hand side are the other elements of the pitch deck that depending on the stage of development you might have or you may not have uh, in, in your deck, at least in the initial deck. Right, so for example, I put an asterisk on uh, slide 11, which are the financials. Now, by the time you get to the point of being able to put together a cash flow forecast, for example, right, you would already have a fairly good idea of how you're going to actually execute on uh, your, your plan, right? Um, so you would have already done some technology development, you may have done proof of concept testing, you might have some preclinical data. Uh, and at that point, uh, you have a fairly good idea of what it's going to do, a pretty decent idea of what the financials might look like. What are your cash needs? What kind of a revenue stream you might expect? Where is it going to come from? So on and so forth. So by the time you get to the financials, you're fairly well developed uh, in your idea. It doesn't mean that you should not have a good view of the direction you're going from a financial standpoint, but in the initial pitch, oftentimes you don't get too deep into that. Okay, you might not have, for example, traction. So you may not have a first customer, you may not have a technology partner at this point, you know, in a very, very early stage of development. But at some point, you're going to be able to have to show that you have some traction, meaning that you've gotten some support, you've gotten some initial funding, perhaps, You've maybe won a business and competition, so on and so forth. And those are sort of good positive signals of progression, right? So anything that you can do to de-risk your venture, de-risk the technology, de-risk the market, uh, 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 um, the, your, your go-to-market strategy, uh, all this will go into you know the, the, um, the tenth slide. But uh, if you're very early, you oftentimes don't have very much going on there. Okay, so let, let's go through each of this in quick succession, uh, and then hopefully uh, that would give you sort of a good idea of what to do. So probably the most important slide in your deck uh, is an articulation of the unmet need, right? So typically you, unmet, you, you articulate an unmet need in the following way, right? You start by saying you're looking for a way to solve what? Well, you're going to solve a problem experienced by a particular group of individuals or a cohort or, a, or, or people within the region, right? 
so you're going to solve a problem experienced by whom and where to achieve some kind of a desired outcome. So here's an example, right? So here's the problem uh, that uh, is sort of known uh, in, in lung surgery, right? So the resection of the upper left lobe is the most complicated proce uh, procedure in lung surgery, uh, requiring patients to be anesthetized for long. Long periods, right? Now, lottery, especially for those that are immunocompromised. And if you think of who typically undergoes uh, lung surgery, it could be cancer patients, for example, right? So, what surgeons need is a way to reduce procedure time to lower morbidity risk during post op recovery. So, that's the unmet need. The unmet need is you have this very complicated procedure and you need a way to reduce the amount of time in that procedure so that your post op recovery. Uh, uh, um, uh, outcomes can be improved, right? So once you have articulated that unmet need, you notice that you have a specific uh, audience. So these are patients undergoing lung surgery, but the unmet need is really experienced by the surgeons, right? Because they need a way to reduce procedure time, right? Uh, and the outcome you're looking for is lower mobility risk during post-op recovery. So when you take a look at your technology, right? Uh, what I tell people is don't get too caught up in the technology, right? To, to put it very bluntly, nobody really cares about your technology, right? What they care is that you're trying to solve a problem. So you've heard of the old adage, right? Nobody buys a three inch drill. What you buy is a three inch hole, right? So you can make a three inch hole in a bunch of different ways, including using a three inch saw drill But really, when you buy a three-inch saw drill, you create a three-inch hole. And perhaps the drill is one way to do it, but there may be other ways you can, you can do that. So that's sort of a typical you know, marketing way of looking at solving an unmet need. So if you are, you know, it's very easy to sort of get caught up in the technology because obviously we are working on the technology. We, we get very enamored by the technology when we start thinking of AI, for example, or you know, a, 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 a large um, a population, uh, the, the older adult, uh, we get very caught up in that. But the, the point of the unmet need is to talk, think about the problem that you're trying to solve, okay? Because there are many ways of solving a problem. And what you have to do is to make a compelling case that your way of solving the problem is the better way. Okay, so... <clears throat> The problem to be solved can fall into sort of three buckets, right? So the first bucket are sort of pains. So when we talk about pains, and I'll show you a quick illustration of what I mean by that, is that you are trying to understand for the people that experience that problem, right? What are the sort of quote unquote pains that they're experiencing because the problem is not solved? Another way to think about a problem to be solved are the gains that you're trying to create. Okay, so how can you help someone live a better life in some, in some way, on some dimension, right? So it could be a combination of two things, either the pain or the gain. And then of course, the job to be done, right? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to help your, your, your audience, your target market, get along in their life, right? We all get along in life by doing tasks, completing jobs, so to speak. So all your customers, all your clients have things that they have to get, they have to do in their life. We call them jobs or tasks or activities. These activities can be easy to do or they can be very difficult to do. And therefore they can either create pain in terms of you know daily living, getting the job done, or if they're easy to do, they can make the life of a lot better. So when you're trying to describe a problem, you want to describe like, what is this problem? How big is it? How significant is the problem? How fast is growing? And more importantly, why is it important for this particular group of people that you're trying to solve the problem for? So again, rather than think about a technology right up front, think about the problem. So this, uh, so, so the first thing is sort of just articulating the problem, right? For, now, the next step is to articulate the problem for the audience or the target market. 
and where that audience uh, is located. And so we typically use something called the TAM SAM and SOM, the total available market, the serviceable available market and the serviceable obtainable market. So the total available market is everybody that falls into a category with that problem. The serviceable available market is everybody that you can actually identify, right? Uh, that has that problem. And then the serviceable obtainable market is everybody that you think you can reasonably reach at the point that you launch your, your product or launch your service or launch your technology. So here's sort of an example of what I mean by that, right? So this is, so, so we are interested in trying to serve older adults with ADHD, right? So the TAM would be all older adults that uh, with ADHD in the United States. And that's a pretty big number right there, right? Now, there are lots of older adults that may have ADHD that may be undiagnosed. So the TAM is sort of a good place to start, but it's not reasonable to assume that you can serve everybody there because you may not know everybody that falls into that category. On the other hand, there are older adults that are diagnosed with ADHD, perhaps living in the state of Maryland, right? This is where Hopkins is, so I just used as an example. And then some subset of that, depending on the product or the service or the technology or the app that you're trying to build, uh, might be reasonably targeted at older adults diagnosed with ADHD that are actually seeking help in Baltimore City. So you could see that while you could conceivably be served all older adults with ADHD in the United States, or even all older adults diagnosed with ADHD in the United States, reasonably at launch, uh, you're, not, you're probably not going to be able to reach all of them. You're probably only going to be able to reach those adults that are diagnosed with ADHD that are actually seeking help, right? So they're diagnosed and they know they need help, perhaps with task initiation or something like that. So you're going to build a product, you know, to help those groups. So you could see that the TAM, SAM, and SOM are good ways of defining uh, who and where your target market is. The third aspect of articulating the unmet need is to articulate the desired outcome, right? So in this example I just gave you, the desired outcome would be uh, older adults with ADHD, diagnosed with ADHD, uh, to be able to consistently initiate and complete daily tasks. So we know that people with ADHD sometimes have problems initiating and completing daily tasks. So they might take longer than is usually uh, needed to do you know, simple tasks during the day. They can get distracted, et cetera. And so there are some people who, who decide that they would pay for perhaps an app or a device or a service that would help them actually get through the day uh, consistently, you know, in getting getting their, their daily tasks done. So that's a customer job that they need done. And the pain that they are experiencing is the inability to consistently initiate and complete tasks, right? And the gain that you're trying to, 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 to create for them is this desired outcome, which is the ability to actually do that, right? So when you articulate on met need, there are always these three elements and you've got to think very hard precisely uh, what the elements are. And when you can do that and put it in a sentence, then you've sort of nailed down that piece. The second uh, uh, element of the pitch deck, the second important element uh, is the opportunity set, right? So the unmet need uh, is a problem we're trying to solve, right? For someone in a particular uh, a, a place uh, at a time with, with a certain outcome that you want to achieve, the translation of that is the opportunity. And typically the opportunity is articulated in terms of a dollar size, right? Now it could be articulated in terms of the number of individuals that might have the problem you're trying to solve or the number of companies that you're trying to service, so on and so forth. But typically what you wanna do is try to convert that to a dollar size. So here is a very back of the envelope kind of a calculation. Uh, and I literally did this by, you know, searching for data online and there are lots of data online you can, you, can, uh, you can acquire actually if you spend a little bit of time searching. Uh, and this is from, you know, a couple of uh, papers that have been published around this. So you've got 
122 million uh, adults potentially uh, with ADHD. 23% uh, of those, uh, 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 so rather 0.23% of those um, uh, adults are in the older category. Uh, and we know from some data that the average cost, and so this is an app, the average uh, annual cost of an app is uh, $61, right? Uh, and so the potential total size, this is the time of the market, is about $1.7 billion. For those uh, adults uh, that, uh, older adults uh, that are diagnosed with ADHD, that could potentially want a solution like that. Now, how many of them actually want a solution? you have to do a little bit more research to figure that out. And how much are they actually willing to pay? You have to do research to figure that out. And typically we run a survey uh, or a conjoint analysis or, or you know, we pay a marketing firm to, to, to do that kind of work, all right? But you're looking at a potential market of about 1.7, maybe $2 billion a year. Now the question is, is that big enough? Well, that sort of depends on how much does it cost you to actually build a product. Uh, how much does it cost you to get a product to market uh, and whether, again, you know, the market is going to accept that. The other element of the opportunity is not just the size, but how fast it's growing, right? So we know that the rate of growth of adults over 50 years old in the United States is about 1.2%, right? Uh, uh, annual growth rate. Um, and, you know, it's an aging population, so that's not trivial. So presumably, if everything remains the same, then you should expect the market to grow about 1.2% a year, simply dependent, you know, simply on the basis that the number of older adults uh, in that category over 50 years old will grow at that rate. Now, the, the CAGA could be higher than that, right? So if your app, you know, uh, turns out to be extremely effective, maybe it cashes word of mouth, it goes viral, perhaps the speed of growth could actually be higher than 1.2%. But, you know, if you are trying to be conservative, uh, you typically use something like population growth, at least in this example. Okay, so the, again, the opportunity is the uh, dollar value of the market that you're trying to, to go after. And why is that important? Because if I'm a financier, if I'm a venture capitalist, I want to know what my potential uh, market is because that tells me what my potential returns could look like, right? So if the market is too small, even if you have, you know, the best in size bread in terms of a technology, you may not be very investable simply because getting a return on investment uh, may not be, you know, your return on investment may not be very attractive uh, for a venture capitalist that's taking a risk on you. The third, the, the, uh, the third slide in your deck would be the solution, right? So the solution is basically a description of your technology in non-technical language, right? So what are you actually going to do? So in this example of, you know, older adults with ADHD uh, trying to improve past initiation and completion behaviors, my solution would be uh, a, a, a mobile phone-based app. Right, maybe based on some uh, 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 AI algorithm that could predict when a, a person uh, might have difficulties initiating tasks and then uh, being able to deliver, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, triggers or, or be able to deliver um, uh, motivational uh, uh, information to, to help them to help them actually uh, actually get past those those problems. Uh, now, the solution has to also say something about why the customer would buy your product, right? So it's not just about the technology. It's why is this particular approach that you're proposing a better approach to what has actually, you know, uh, what exists out there right now? And this recognizes the fact that your customers, even if they have a pain, uh, still live their lives day to day, right? So, you know, we human beings are remarkably good at uh, living with their problem. Okay, we do that all the time, right? It doesn't mean that if we don't have a solution to our problem, life stops. We just figure out how to get by. Uh, or we might have a solution that already exists, but maybe relative to your, your solution, it may not be a very good solution. So you have to say something about why does this actually create value for the customer? Like, why would the customer care 
right? And why is it better than what already exists out there? So something you know, along those lines, uh, so that again, the solution is not just about the technology, it's about actually solving the problem. Now, the value proposition, you, you, you've heard of the term value proposition. The value proposition is essentially the marriage, the collision between the need on the right-hand side and the solution on the left-hand side. So your solution are the products and services that relieve the pain and or create some gain for the customer, okay? So you've got solutions on the left-hand side and then you've got the need on the right-hand side. And when the solution meets the need, you've created some value. Now notice that value is only relevant to the customer that is actually willing to pay for that product or your service, right? So value is not some uniform statement of, um, of, of the product feature, right? Value is defined by the customer is defined by your client. If nobody cares, it doesn't matter how good your technology is, there is no value, to put it very bluntly, right? Value only exists literally in the eye of the client. So understanding your client's needs, understanding your customer's needs, understanding what they're willing to pay for, meaning what they're willing to give up in exchange to acquire your product or service, that is, that is value. Uh, and that happens to be probably the most, I wouldn't say difficult, but one of the most challenging aspects of articulating uh, your, uh, uh, your, your venture idea, right? To, to a potential investor. So uh, let's see now, the next part is the ask. So, you know, it's odd, but oftentimes when I listen to pitches, I, you know, I always end up with a question. So what are you asking me to do? Right, so the ask is uh, the action. It's essentially the action slide, right? So you're listening to me. You're listening to this great idea I've got. What do you, you know, what what do I want from you? So it could be as simple as how much money are you seeking? What are you going to offer in exchange for the money? Uh, what are you going to do with the money, right? Uh, and more importantly, once you get the money, what are some of the key milestones? you're going to actually achieve with the money. So how am I going to put money to work for you? If I'm pitching as I did, uh, 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 you know, somebody who's going to be the CEO of my company, then I'm going to ask them, you know, to sign on as a CEO. What are they going to get in exchange? Equity, salary, um, you know, what are some of the milestones that uh, I hope having, you know, having a CEO of my company is going to result in? Um, funding rounds, uh, interest from investors, so on and so forth, right? So I will tell you that in my company, you know, when we were raising money, the biggest question that investors kept asking us was, when are you going to get a CEO? Because my co-founder and I are full-time faculty at the university. Uh, and while we have taken the venture as far as we could, ultimately investors are going to look and say, who's going to run the show? If I'm going to put money behind you, I'm not going to, you know, accept some part-time, you know, part-time CEO. I want somebody who's going to be accountable. I want somebody to run the show. I want somebody who's going to pick up the phone when I call. Uh, and so, you know, getting the CEO was an important step to raising money. Uh, that may not necessarily be the case uh, for many of your ventures, especially if they're early stage, but ultimately at some point, you may have to pitch somebody to come and join your company and you may not have a lot of money to pay them. So, uh, so you have to convince them, right, uh, of the upside of the opportunity. So uh, the fifth uh, uh, important slide would be the team. So why do you care about the team? Because the team tells you how ready you are to execute, right? So who's on the team? What, is, what are the experiences? What are they contributing? Each person must have a role that they will bring uh, to the table. And that role translates into activity, into value that they're creating for the company, into basically moving the venture to the next step. So earlier on, you probably have a technology person or persons. Uh, you're probably going to a marketplace. Uh, you're probably going to need, if not a CEO, at least a project manager or a CEO that will coordinate the activities to make sure that everybody's on task, so on and so forth. So the 
team is actually very important and you want the team to be tuned precisely to the stage of development of the company and also provide the company with a platform for uh, going on to uh, further stages of development, right? So now we go to the right-hand side of the deck, which are all the sort of, I wouldn't call them optional, but again, it sort of depends on how far your development is going, uh, how far along in the development cycle you have, but certainly you have to have uh, one slide on the technology or the product itself, right? So this is goes a little bit further than just the solution, right? This talks about the description of the technology, the key features, intellectual property. That's very important, especially if you have IP attached to that technology, if you have patents, trademarks, copyrights, this is where you, you basically show that there's value behind, behind your technology, right? It's not just pie in the sky. Uh, you want to talk about major development milestones, whether milestones that you've already met or milestones that you will be meeting. And all this basically demonstrates that you understand what it's going to take to bring technology from concept to proof of concept to uh, uh, you know, preclinical, you know, if, if, it's, if it's something you're gonna be using in the clinic uh, and you know, right through to you know, uh, first manufacture, okay? So that, that basically tells the potential investor that you sort of understand what it takes. You understand most importantly, the risks behind your technology development cycle, right? Because they wanna know that you know what your risks are, that you know, you're not sort of pie in the sky. Uh, use lots of images, visuals, videos. Uh, I typically tell people don't use, you know, uh, lengthy written explanations. So, for example, if you're building an app, you know, make sure you have a wireframe that you could sort of just play a video around to demonstrate how the interface would actually work. And those things are very useful, especially with technologies. You want to show uh, images and visuals, right? They they get the point across very quickly and very efficiently. Uh, then you do want to talk about your competition. Again, there are very, very few ideas that are completely blue sky, completely new to the marketplace. Uh, if you have thought about it, somebody else would have thought about it. So you got to do a little bit of research around how else have others solved this problem, right? You know, frankly, there are not that many problems that have not been identified. There are many ways of solving problems. And so now, two things that I always want to uh, uh, highlight. Competitors are not the same as the marketplace, right? The market is are essentially uh, your customers, the needs that you're trying to, to meet. The comp your competitors are all these other companies and all these other startups that are trying to solve the same set of needs uh, that you're trying to solve. Maybe not exactly the same needs, but sort of within the same ballpark. These are all your competitors, right? Um, more importantly, you want to be very honest about your competition, right? What makes them competitive? Okay, so in what ways are they better than you? And in what ways are you better than them? And obviously, what you want to do is highlight the ways that you are better than them as being, you know, more meaningful, uh, the basis on which you're creating value to the customer. So you do a technology landscape here. Uh, you know, you do a lot of research, either primary work uh, in the market, talking to uh, potential customers, talking to other companies that have, you know, uh, tried to approach this problem. Uh, sometimes you want to talk to suppliers because suppliers are the nexus of many companies, et cetera. So by the way, one of the things that I always tell people to do when they put a pitch deck together is to have lots and lots of data in it, okay? So numbers, data, they're much better than just arguments, okay? Arguments are very easy to dismiss. Data is a lot more difficult to dismiss. So if you're trying to build a convincing deck, make sure you have lots of data in there from secondary and primary research that you're doing. And the best kind of primary research is to just go out there and talk to potential customers, talk uh, to others uh, in the industry, uh, talk to clinicians, talk to engineers, right? So you don't want to be developing your solution in a vacuum. You want to constantly be out there testing your ideas in the marketplace. 
Uh, the eighth slide is the business model. So when we talk about a business model, there are basically two parts to every business model. Some of you may have seen something called the business model canvas. I'm not gonna go through that here, but essentially the business model canvas is just a way of articulating the system of activities that a company goes through in order to produce goods and services, right? So part one of the business model are all those activities associated with making something. Part two includes all those activities associated with selling something. So on the one hand, you have to create, design, manufacture your product and service. And then on the other hand, you have to sell it, right? You have to market it, reach customers, advertise, you know, all the systems needed to transact the sale, deliver the product, and so on and so forth. So when we talk about a business model, that's what we're really talking about. We're talking about the system of value creation of making products and services and getting into the marketplace. So uh, you want to have one slide that's sort of illustrating what is it going to take to actually get your product or your service into the hands of the customers so they can use it, right? So if they're clinicians, how are you going to get it into the clinic? Uh, what are the processes you have to get through? You may have to get an FDA uh, certification for this. Um, you may have to um, get CMS uh, uh, to pay for it. So you have to sort of have an understanding of what it takes, you know, to get a CPT code, to get a reimbursement uh, level, et cetera. And then uh, something that doesn't necessarily always show up in every pitch, but if you are matured enough, you definitely have to be in there, which is uh, number nine, the marketing plan. And the marketing plan is simply how are you, how are you gonna reach your customers? Right. What channels are you going to use? Um, have you actually tried reaching customers? Uh, what has been your experience? Um, do you have information on your customer acquisition costs? You know, how much does it cost to actually acquire a customer? What do you have to invest in order to get the attention of your customers? Uh, and what is it? What is the lifetime value of a customer, especially if it's a repeat purchase product? Right. How often is the customer going to buy that product? At what frequency? At what volume? Uh, and all of these things add up to the total value of your customer for your revenue line. Right. So, uh, I would say that probably the most difficult aspect of putting a financial plan together, which is you know the last slide, is trying to estimate what your revenues are going to be. That's probably. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the most difficult, but it's the, it's the most uncertain because you're doing a lot of guesswork. Uh, and in order to reduce the uncertainty, you again, you want to conduct research, customer discovery, uh, and you want to try to estimate these costs as much as you can. Uh, again, use lots of images and videos. Uh, oftentimes, I will tell um, uh, uh, companies, you know, if you can imagine what a customer looks like and what their life, uh, what they might experience in their life, uh, then you want to build a, uh, perhaps a customer persona, right? Tell a story about your customer. Tell a story about how they live their life, how they go about solving their problem, and then insert into that story your product or your service uh, in order to uh, sort of position how your product or service uh, helps them, you know, live their life better or, as I said, you know, solve the pains that, that they are experiencing. Uh, then we have the traction slide. And the traction slide is important, especially if you're going for follow-on financing rounds. Presumably, you've gotten some money earlier on in order to build a product, in order to test your concept. And so there should have been progress made, right? Uh, you should maybe have preliminary data. So this is where you start talking about what you have done, the early wins, uh, that you have gotten, uh, maybe strategic partnerships that you have formed, um, you know, testimonials or mentions in the press, anything that shows that your idea is more than just, you know, a piece of drawing on a napkin, that it actually has got legs. You know, that's what traction means, that it's gotten interest, drawn attention from the marketplace, from potential investors or potential partners, strategic partners, so on and so forth. All that stuff comes in. The point being that anything that you can do to illustrate that your venture has been de-risked uh, helps the investor uh, make a better decision, right? Uh, because investors, interestingly enough, 
want to make money, and the way to make money is to reduce risks uh, while understanding that risk is always part of every equation. So the final, uh, 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 at least in this example, the, the final slide would be your, uh, your financials. Let's see, so. Now what goes in, so, so this is a little bit of an eye chart, all right? So what do I typically want to see if you show me a financial, uh, uh, if you show me financials, right? If you get to that point, what do I want to see? Uh, you typically want to show your break-even cash flows, okay? You want to show that from the time of initial investment to product development to launch, how long is it going to take for you to actually break even from a cash flow stand, standpoint? You want to show your unit economics, meaning your contribution margin, okay? And your contribution margin is essentially the money that's left over. So essentially, your, it's your gross margin. Right. So what does it cost for you to make one unit of your product, for you to sell one unit of the product? What's left over from that is a contribution margin, which is the amount of money that you have left to cover all of your overheads, your fixed costs, et cetera. Right. Uh, and when you get to zero, that's your break even. So you want to be able to show that. You want to be able to discuss your burn. So when you take money from investors, you're going to use it presumably to develop your product or to acquire customers. How fast are you going to be using up that money? Because that will tell you how many rounds that you need to raise, what your milestones are going to be. And again, it helps your investor think a little bit about the risks that they're undertaking uh, and to help them you know, figure out uh, what they need from you uh, in terms of a return. Uh, you want to be able to show projections of your revenues, obviously, and your expenses. Most importantly, you want to be fairly transparent about your assumptions and your risk areas. So essentially, you want a bullet point list of what could go wrong and hopefully what you can do about hedging against what can go wrong. Okay, Because there's no plan that is perfect. So you want to be very clear-eyed about the risks behind your technology development process, uh, the risk behind your uh, market acquisition activities, and what you can do to hedge against those risks. So here are some sort of do's and don'ts. Uh, so when you put a pitch deck together, uh, I always tell people more, more pictures, more visuals, uh, lots of white spaces, fewer words, right? That's sort of the general rule of thumb. Uh, the deck is not supposed to tell your story. You tell your story. The deck is supposed to help you tell the story, right? So if you have to read that, then you have lost the audience, okay? So telling the story is important. Engaging people emotionally is important. You know, try to get them to understand the problem you're trying to solve. If your audience instinctively understands the problem and more importantly, um, is sympathetic to the problem, then you're more likely to get, to get attention. You're more likely to be compelling. They're more likely to be forgiving on some pieces of your pitch that may not be completely well formed. Okay, so I mean, it's just basic human behavior. Uh, you want to limit each slide to expressing one idea, right? So I've shown you sort of a deck with 11 slides. In each of these slides, you want one main point that you want to convey, right? The unmet need, that's the one main point. Your break-even or your unit economics, uh, that's the one key point in your financials. Um, you know, what's unique or special about your technology, that's one key point. So make sure that one slide has one idea, one message. Um, there are a few other things that are important. So when you put your deck together, make sure that it's consistent in terms of look and feel. Um, you know, just be very, very aware of what you're conveying uh, when you're putting a deck together, right? You're trying to convey a professional image. And of course, practice, practice, practice. That's the most important thing. Uh, you want to be able to practice things so that you can tell the story with your eyes closed, so that you can tell the story without even looking at the deck. Okay, uh, the deck again is something is a visual aid. It's not supposed to be telling your story. You tell the story. You are the entrepreneur. Uh, you know, you you are the founder of your company. 
uh, don't make it too long. Uh, again, um, you know, uh, typically the average VC attention cradle capacity here, uh, point number two is about 10 slides, plus minus, all right? So just understand your audience. Uh, and it isn't that VCs are uninterested, it's that they listen to a lot of this stuff, like a lot. And so they get very impatient if you don't get to the point quickly. Uh, don't read from your slides, you know, just sort of standard good presentation technique. Um, don't create a text-rich picture per presentation. Basically, one of the things that, you know, bugs me a lot about presentations is if somebody puts up, say, the cash flow statement, right, in 12-point font, uh, you know, and I'm sitting 20 feet away, there's basically no way I can read the thing, right? So don't put anything up that cannot actually be read. Okay, uh, and the best thing is don't make people read your slides, right? Make them react to it visually. Uh, if you force people to read your slides, pretty much you've sort of lost them. Uh, 